I lessons from my mentors. And this one is from 2000, Tom Zenti. And what he talked about with me was presence and the importance of being in person, especially when dealing with tough subjects, super easy to hide behind email and phone calls. So I wanted to give you three quick examples on how that's done and what the results can be. So we all know that too often we hide behind emails. My rule that I came up with was no more than four back and forths. If there was four back and forths, it definitely went to a video or phone call because obviously the communication wasn't happening and you know how that communication goes, whether it's texting or emailing back and forth, you just keep piling it on and, and your emotions go unchecked. So at some point you got to cut it off and you have to talk. And then if the talking isn't particularly helpful and depending on the topic, you have to be in person. And I know we're in the day of, of video and I love it and I take advantage of it, obviously. But there's times when it's got to be in person. So I came up with two phrases. One is called I to I. So the letter I, but meaning I. I, the number two, and the letter I. So it's three letters, numbers, I to I. And so I came up with that after that lesson. And I've always tried to practice that. So anything that has a heightened level of urgency is potentially problematic, super important, has to be eye to eye. The other sort of little tool I came up with was called emotion for emotion. E for E, three letter number combination. Emotion for emotion. You have to match the emotion of the other person. So if it's something very significant and serious to them, even though you might not think it's that important, it's important to you because it's important to them. So key, these are such little things when I tell you make a big difference in your ability to lead well and have people who want to follow you. So I recall putting this into action. We had this doctor, I, I'm gonna name him because he's just a good guy. And if he ever watches this, he'll laugh, but it's Dr. Ed Michelson. He was like this hotshot ED doc. We recruited from a big place in Chicago over to University Hospitals in Cleveland. And he had high expectations and high demand. And our IT was really crappy. I think you've heard that before. We were on our way to get really good but we were really crappy and he's a yeller, you know, and I'm not, I don't advocate that style of leadership and I don't think he's like that anymore, but it was a phase, you know? And so he called and our offices at this point, unfortunately were moved off campus, but we we're still walkable. So it's probably a five minute fast walk. And I remember he called me and he was, I was in my office standing up, you know, he was just reading me out, rah, rah, rah. you know, you could like one of these things, put the phone a foot, a yard away and you would still hear him. So anyways, I decided, oh my gosh, this is an I to I, E for E all the way. So I, I couldn't like get a word in, like get him to hang up or, you know, say, hey, stop, I'm coming over. So I left the phone dangling type of thing off the desk and I went over there and I'm telling you, I kid you not, when I got there, he turns around because he was in the middle of the ED, he was hot. He's still screaming at the phone. It is five minutes later and I walk and he had his ex shocked expression, but I'm telling you his demeanor completely changed. He wasn't being an ass anymore because I showed up in person because he knew that I took it serious and that I would come see him and see for myself what he was talking about. So we had put in all this technology, you know, and it was just taking up so much space. So the promise that was made to him when he came was he's going to get a whole new ED. And he finally did, but it took about four years longer than anyone anticipated. It was cramped and I saw it. I was like, Dan, I know what he's talking about. All the nurses didn't have room to do their work. The docs didn't have room. The techs didn't have room. Patients were cramped. It was pretty bad. And so uh, the next day we had all the right IT people come over and we reconfigured a lot of things to make their workflow better. I would not have known it except to be there. Otherwise, I would just say, oh, this guy's complaining, this doctor's complaining, oh, that's all they do. No, you go there, you see it for yourself, eyeball to eyeball, emotion to emotion. Mm -hmm. Another time, I had a call or an email. I can't even remember now. And it was from the NICU. And they were saying that hardly any of the devices work and they had a 
a line of waiting for people to utilize, you know, to get into the EHR. And I was like, no way. So I was aghast if that were true, everything I saw read. So again, I got my butt out of the office, went over to the children's hospital, went to the NICU, and by gosh, I still remember that scene super vividly. And it really bothered me quite a bit. And there were literally like seven or eight residents and, and other docs standing in line to use the EMR to take care of little babies. And so meanwhile, instead of doing what they should be doing and talking to the parents and taking care of the babies, they're freaking standing in line. And, and then I looked down the hall and there's four or five, we had all these, uh, you know, wows, all these mobile units. And they all have little signs on them, like uh, battery out, uh, monitor doesn't work. And they're just standing there. And, and then after I walked in and saw the scene, the head of the NICU, she comes out. And to this day, I can't figure out how it happened, but I just went and gave her a hug and we embraced it. We we're like crying. It was like ridiculous, you know, thinking back, <clears throat> but we were crying because we both realized the frustration and how wrong, how wrong the situation was. It's like, and I was embarrassed. And I mean, this is my team and how could we be that bad? I knew we were bad when I took over, but dang, I didn't realize how bad. So immediately, you know, I found, sent a bunch of people out to find wows that were working. And maybe there were different units that didn't need all that they had and sort of rearranged them so they could be functioning. And then uh, it's for another time, what I ended up doing with those two individuals in my leadership team um, but I'll just finish that. They were not part of my team after that day. Um, so that's the emotion for emotion part. She was clearly upset, impacted. And I met her where she was and she met me where I was. Cause I was the same way. I was like, Oh, so unbelievable. You can see it still bothers me today. And then, um, you know, another time, we have a bully doc. I won't mention his name, but this, this person was a bully. Like, it's just hard to believe that our organization tolerated this. And there's still organizations like that, that tolerate that. And uh, it's not going to change until you confront it. So I sort of, he wasn't a bully with me because I was CIO. But I heard stories. I didn't do enough fast enough. But it finally got to me one day when another one of my direct reports came up to me and he was crying. And I was like, dang, I got to step it up here. This is on me. So it's not going to be a phone call, a video call. I could have done either. It's not going to be an email. No, I'm going to meet that guy and I'm going to hit him emotional, emotionally <laughs> equivalency. And, uh, that's what he did. He never effed with our people again. And so that's what you have to do, whether it's, you know, a situation like that where you're dealing with obstinate people, where you have to protect your teams. Um, if it's something you have to do leadership wise or clinically wise, you need to be there in person. And that was really the lesson. So that's that's it. It's a short one this time. Because I don't think it needs to be any longer. I think you get the point. But if it helps you remember, think about eye to eye. There's some conversation, and it's not video eye. There's some conversations that have to be in person. Don't shortchange the opportunity and don't, don't 
you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Don't be afraid when you need to do the right thing. You do the right thing. And then the other one's emotions for emotion. So that it has to be genuine. But if that person upset, you you should probably be upset. If that person's emotional, you should meet them where they are. So those are the things that have really helped me and changing multiple organizations is that whole concept. So that's lesson from my mentor is go see people in person. Nothing, nothing replaces in-person communication.